Shocking details have emerged about the death of a two-year-old girl on the central coast of New South Wales, whose mother has today plead, pleaded guilty to manslaughter. The case strengthens the argument for at-risk children to be removed from their parents and put into foster care. But the foster system in some states is buckling under the pressure of too many children and not enough homes. Victoria's largest child welfare organisation has told Lateline that the system is facing a crisis and could collapse unless it undergoes a dramatic overhaul. In New South Wales, caseworkers to deal with abused children are in short supply. While the number of people wanting to take in foster children has declined, so has the amount of money available to support them. Others say fostering is not the solution and are calling for the sensitive issue of adopting out children to be put back on the political and social agenda. Hamish Fitzsimmons reports and Candace Talberg was the producer. Ian and Karen Dobby's own children are grown up, but they're parenting again to children the state has decided aren't safe with their own families. The siblings they're currently looking after are in care for the third time in their young lives. They've got a lot of potential, so if things worked well for them, they'll do very well. If they end up back with their family, unless their family changes what they're doing, mm. uh, basically their lives will be written off. Uh, that they'll, they'll be welfare dependent, um, uh, well versed in police issues, sort of things that will all be, it won't do well for them. And that, that, that's the reality of life with them. The pressure on the system is enormous, according to people like Sandy DeWolf from Berry Street, a non-government foster care organisation that's been running for 130 years. The um, number of children who have been removed from their parents because they can't live safely at home across Australia has increased by 27% over the last five years, so nearly 40,000 children. And the, um, the availability of foster carers has de decreased as that number has increased. 43% of foster children are under five years old and Sandy DeWolf is concerned this shortage could lead to a return of babies in children's homes. She says Victoria has lost 225 or 15% of its foster carers in the last two years. We've got a significant increase in the children needing care and a significant decrease in uh, foster carers available and willing to do the work then clearly we have we you know we don't want to have to go back to institutions but you do wonder in five years time unless we look at new models of foster care just what will the options be one option on the table is early intervention to prevent neglect or abuse it would also make it easier for children who've been repeatedly removed from their families to be adopted new south wales is bringing in laws to make it easier for foster parents to adopt and the Northern Territory Chief Minister Adam Giles has backed early permanent intervention. Jeremy Samet from the Centre for Independent Studies says with intervention, early is best. We don't do enough to remove children early enough, so they end up having really high needs, end up not being able to live in a normal, normal foster home. That encourages carers to drop out because they're so difficult to, to, to care for. And we're getting to the point now where we're going to start re-residentialising the care system with professional carers, particularly mental health professionals, to look after these kids who've been damaged. While the peak body for child welfare agencies agrees there's a growing shortage of foster carers, it argues against the early permanent removal of children, saying family is always preferable to foster care. I think it's a very simplistic view to say that actually where you see child maltreatment and neglect that the only course of action is to remove these kids. Yes, in some instances it is, but in many instances it's actually better to address the causal factors because then you might have the chance of actually having these kids go on, not to repeat the cycle. Some say the case for early intervention has been highlighted by the murder of Kaisha Weepat by her mother. The Department of Community Services had reported her abuse, but Kaisha remained in her mother's care. Departments like DOCS won't intervene because they're wedded to this ideology of family preservation that ends up damaging children and puts the interests of parents before the interests of children. While there's debate about when to remove at-risk children from troubled families, appropriate resources are also a concern. The union representing DOCS employees in New South Wales says there's an acute shortage of caseworkers which has resulted in many cases of abuse never being investigated. Whenever you've got a vacancy rate of 80% or even higher in some offices, then you struggle to get your work done. If only 40% of children at risk of significant harm are getting a follow-up visit from a caseworker, the state is letting children who are vulnerable in the state down. 
The Dobbies were quickly made aware of how neglected their current foster children had been. They had no bedding uh, on their beds, basically. Uh, so he'd put, they'd pull like a towel type thing over them to keep themselves warm and then... Uh, still just, reverts back to that now. Does. We still find him under that little blanket that he has. Like there's blankets and dunas, but he's still reverting back to that behaviour because that's, what he, that's comforting for him. Some former foster children back the view that had they been placed earlier and permanently with the same family, things would have been much easier. 22-year-old Nigel went into care when he was three. Moving to more than 20 foster homes before he and his younger brother were placed in permanent care when he was six. My social issues wouldn't have been so much affected. School would probably still be the same, I'm assuming. Um, but my social interaction with people would have been a lot more at a child's level rather than a younger, really young level. So going into counselling had to fix all that up and that took ages. Nigel is one of the system's rare success stories. He's now studying engineering at Melbourne University. When I went into permanent care, I was starting to feel like I was actually having a family, a proper family, where I was going to be loved and treated like a normal person. The sector is struggling not only to find people to look after foster children, it's also unable to support the carers. Foster carers are frustrated at the lack of financial support, especially for children who have needs greater than most due to what they've been through. Vince Ataro has been fostering children in Melbourne for 12 years. The payments have been cut by a third. Um, completely cut right down. And um, because all the kids I've talked about have been really high needs kids. So um, high needs kids, you get paid slightly more for that. But the payments have been cut down by a third. Foster parents know they'll never replace a child's birth mother and father. But those like Ian and Karen Dobby hope their homes can bring stability to young lives that have already seen too much. They want to be back at home. So uh, because they want to be at home, which is fair enough, uh, they miss their parents regardless of what went on in their family. Uh, but there's, still, there's nightmares and there's things that go on from, from the interaction with his parents. So it's, uh, you're just trying to have them be in a safe environment, you know, a, a place which everyone normally would call normal, a normal, mm. loving environment. But as the number of carers continues to decline and more children are removed from their homes, what that safe, normal place will look like in the future is uncertain. Hamish Fitzsimmons, Late Line.